I have to tell you that this strikes me as very interesting because I thought, because I've never done one of these interviews for a DVD, and I basically disapprove of it, but it makes me think of the time at the beginning of Reds, the very beginning of Reds, I thought I cannot do this movie unless I get Walter Lippmann, who was the greatest liberal columnist in American journalism history. And my friend Arthur Schlesinger set up an interview, and he looked at me with the sourest of expressions and basically saying, what is it that you want? And, uh, and uh, I just said that to you, what is it that you want? <laughs> Jack Reed? Profits. Organize. All the workers together. One big union. Now, what the hell you want to waste your time with a lot of red propaganda nobody's ever going to print? It's the truth. Does that mean anything around here? What I do know, and what I did know then, was that no one had tackled the development of the American left between 1915 and 1920, which is what this period deals with and that uh, there was a gigantic fear of, uh, of communism. Am I being tried for witchcraft? Miss Brown, tell me, are there no decent, God-fearing Christians among the Bolsheviks? And I went to Moscow. I wanted to go to uh, look around, which I was able to uh, finagle my way into, and um, found that in, in Moscow, uh, the hero was John Reed. He was buried in the Kremlin Wall. There's a lot to be said for that. But I was interested in Insurgent Mexico, his book about traveling with Pancho Villa, and of course, 10 Days That Shook the World, which is considered to be the great masterpiece. And I was particularly interested in that group of people that included Max Eastman and Eugene O'Neill and those people in New York and in Provincetown, Massachusetts, and painters and writers and and these people who uh, really thought that something else would be uh, possible in American politics. It what capitalists can take this country into war anytime they Wait. damn well please. The only impact you can make is in the street. But the idea of this woman, Louise Bryant, who was a, an, an, an admirably industrious uh, person of aspirations that were high-minded, and, and then um, the relationship they had, and then, of course, the brevity of his life itself, uh, I thought was uh, dramatic. I had written the original treatment of the movie, and that took years. So I had that treatment, and then I finally realized that I had to do it with contemporary people. So I decided to collaborate with the British playwright Trevor Griffiths, who was very strict Marxist, who I felt would keep me or John Reed in line with the dogmatism of it. You're editorializing here. I never editorialize. At the end. Wait. You're right. Turn it. Reds, of course, the subject of Reds, if you're going to go into the political, the polemical, and the dialectical aspects of the picture, who would finance a movie like this? So I made a picture called Heaven Can Wait first, which was more accessible to the finance. And then I came around to uh, finally doing this picture. It was very much motivated by my own political activism at that time. Probably had a lot to do with what I thought was a mistaken uh, American um, paranoia about communism, and most particularly in Vietnam. So finally, I thought, if I don't do this, uh, it, it, it won't be done. And uh, there were a couple of studios who would have done pretty much whatever picture I wanted to do at that time, but I felt an allegiance to Paramount, to Barry Diller and uh, Charlie Blue Dorn, uh, particularly, and they'd been very supportive on the Heaven Can Wait, and uh, they were smart. I certainly knew that, uh, that, that it was not a high-concept popular subject, but the word commercial to me is a horrid word and should be abolished from the language of filmmakers' decisioning. The, all you can do is really say, am I interested in this? And if that's so, then that's all you really can do. And it was so much a project, not only of the mind, but of the heart. I wanted the decision to be made as a group because I thought it would jeopardize whoever decided to say yes to a three and a half hour movie about a communist who dies. And uh, I thought uh, that's not gonna sound uh, hugely uh, 
entertaining. So I asked Charlie Bludorn, whom I liked very much, that I would like to meet with the, the group of them. There was Barry Diller, Michael Eisner, and, and Charlie Bludorn in a meeting at Paramount. If I remember correctly, I went to the office and I said, I'll sit outside. I don't want other people to read this uh, script. And Charlie read the script, and uh, Barry Diller, and uh, I believe Michael Eisner also read the script, and they uh, were in a meeting. I came back into the room. They seemed to be looking mostly at their shoes. And Charlie said to me, um, what is this picture going to cost? I said, I, I, I don't really, uh, I don't know. That's the honest answer. But I said, Charlie, I know somebody who will make this picture, but my loyalty is to Paramount. You know, you've done well by me, I've done well by you, so let's make the movie if you, if you want to make it. So I went out of the room again and sat as if I were at the dentist, and, and, um, and they talked for a while. I came back in again, they talked a little more, they sent me out of the room again, I sat there for a while. And finally I came in, they all seemed sort of depressed. And they said, uh, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna make the movie. And here you had a company, Gulf and Western, which owned Paramount, which was the most competitive, the most capitalistic. And you had this company put up the financing for a film about uh, John Reed, a great figure in the history of socialism and the US, communism, et cetera, and do it with a happy face.